Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Lynn Rubenstein. I'm the executive director of the Northeast Recycling Council. Um, why is it pausing screen share? There we go. Um, uh, and with me today is Terry Goldberg, the executive director of NMOA. And this webinar about strategies for collecting residential food waste is being offered jointly by NERC and NMOA. So we're delighted to have you here today. Before we get started, I have some housekeeping to do. And of course, to thank our generous sponsors, um, we have uh, Vanguard is a gold, excuse me, Vanguard Renewables is our gold sponsor. Uh, silver sponsor is Casella and bronze sponsor is SureClose. So thank you to all of them. We, we really do appreciate that. I'd like to note that this webinar is being recorded. That means there will be a recording posted. The most common question we get is, will this be report recorded? Yes, it is being recorded. It will be on the NERC homepage by this evening. You will receive a message from GoToWebinar tomorrow about that. And the PowerPoint presentations will also be available. So we're gonna save questions till the very end but we want you to ask questions. So for those that may not be entirely familiar with the GoToWebinar platform, on the right-hand side of your screen uh, is a little dashboard, which is either fully open right now, and you see a gray row that says questions with a little arrow. You click on the arrow, it opens the box. You type in your question and hit return, and um, Terry and I will be monitoring the questions, then um, we will, uh, if you don't see that, then you've got at the top of your screen a little orange arrow. Click on the orange arrow, and then the same thing. Look for the question line and type in your question. And as I think I said, we're going to save the questions until the after our presenters. I believe that the recordings and PowerPoints are also going to be posted on the NMOA website. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Now, I want to note that we've had uh, a change in the lineup. Um, unfortunately, Phoebe Little couldn't be here, but we are ecstatic that Connor Miller uh, from Black Earth, uh, also a private hall uh, company, will be speaking. And um, I'll give you his bio in a couple of moments. So first, we're gonna be hearing from Amy Donovan. Amy is the program director of Franklin County Solid Waste Management District in Greenfield, Massachusetts. The Solid Waste District manages programs for 21 member towns, including 17 transfer stations and 25 public schools. 10 transfer stations in Franklin County offer free drop-off organics programs for residents, and all 25 district schools divert food waste from the trash. Next, we'll be hearing from Bob Spencer, Bob is a part-time executive director of Wyndham Solid Waste Management District in Brattleboro, Vermont. The district operates the second largest food waste composting facility in Vermont and recycles food scraps from the town of Brattleboro's residential curbside collection program, as well as commercial and institutional organics. The district's Brattle Grow compost through a network of distributors. Bob has served as contributing editor to BioCycle magazine for 25 years and authors numerous articles and presentations. He also provides consulting services to public and private clients on composting, anaerobic digestion, permits, and everybody's favorite, odor management. He has a range of solid waste composting experience, including being a plant manager for a 150 ton per day composting facility in Marlboro, Massachusetts. He is also on the board of directors for the Composting Association of Vermont and on the board of directors for the Northern New England chapter of the Solid Waste Association of North America. Last but not least, we're gonna hear from Connor Miller. Connor worked for Jackson Hole curbside recycling while ski bumming out west for a few years after college. He may have the most interesting um, bio here, apologies. Driving trucks with trailers daily around town and sub freezing temps, living in a treehouse on extremely low rent, and climbing up high mountains to ski down gave Connor the perfect backdrop to, of course, 
start a compost company. What else would he do? Endlessly making one step at a time, trudging up the mountain of starting a company, making risk calculations and route finding for efficiency, and of course, living on a low income for many years. Connor founded the Black Earth Compost Company 10 years ago and has since grown to become the largest provider of residential curbside composting in New England. Black Earth operates two compost sites and also collects from commercial customers of all sizes. Um, so thank you, uh, everybody. Really appreciate this. Um, Amy, I am about to uh, give you the power um, and we will make uh, you the presenter. And um, I'm going to ask that the rest of us turn off our cameras and be sure to mute ourselves. And uh, I look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, can you see my screen? Absolutely. Good. Um, so my presentation is about municipal organics collection in Franklin County, Massachusetts. I'm with Franklin County Solid Waste Management District. And as Lynn uh, said in the bio, um, we have 21 member towns in Franklin County that choose to participate in our program and what they get out of it is professional you know somewhat cutting edge uh waste management programs and it's so my reason for telling you that is it's not um a, a, a program that's funded by the county or the state or the feds uh, it's it's funded by fee for service programs and also those 21 member towns so um we're able to really focus in on some of these waste management uh, programs and think about how to reduce trash as much as we can. So <clears throat> this opening slide has a very neat and tidy little picture of the program at the Bernardston, Massachusetts um, transfer station. And it shows a two cubic yard dumpster, which yes, is very small but it's a great program and they just went up to a four cubic yard um, this past year after only having the program for about a year uh, they went to a larger dumpster um, so what are we talking about here we're talking about franklin county um, so this is in western mass uh, i'm get, telling you where it is because most people don't know where it is so forgive me if you know um, so we're in between uh, UMass Amherst, Northampton area, um, down in the, ooh, can you see my, you can see my mouse, great. Um, which is down in um, the lower Pioneer Valley. And we cover a, a 500 um, square miles in Franklin County. The county itself is 700 square miles. Uh, and the map that you see here covers those 700 square miles. I say 500 because not all the towns are member towns of our district. Uh, Vermont borders up us to the north and Boston is just way over there. Forget about them, just kidding. Um, so I made this map uh, to show how many transfer stations and schools are currently diverting organics from the trash. Um, so just a note about uh, terminology here. When we're talking about uh, composting, sometimes we use the term organics. Uh, sometimes people use the term uh, food scraps. I choose purposely the term composting because that is a term that so many people are familiar with. And I have found that people who are new to these types of programs, people in the public, realm get a little bit confused when you use um, words like um, organics. I've actually had people say to me, oh, does it have to be organically grown to go in here? <laughs> and the answer is no. It means organically based. Uh, it's from the earth. It will, it will compost or it will become compost and fall back into the earth. Uh, we're also, just in case anybody doesn't know, uh, we're also talking about um, large-scale composting programs here. Uh, we're not talking about, we'll, we'll mention it because we love it, we're not talking so much about backyard composting. We're talking about 
um, food waste that is sent to a commercial facility where they compost large volumes, turn it frequently, and um, get those piles up to a hot temperature. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so these programs accept meat, bones, dairy, oily foods, cooked foods, uncooked foods. If it's any kind of food product, it can go in there. Uh, as well as paper products, paper towels, paper napkins, really dirty pizza boxes that can't be recycled, compostable tableware, compostable coffee cups. Okay, so you get the point. It's a lot of waste. So on this map, you can see the green, uh, the green triangle programs um, are those where the materials are sent to Martin's Farm, which is in Greenfield here, right in the center of our county. Um, the triangles that are uh, blue triangle are sent to Clearview Composting, which is a small scale, smaller scale compost facility in Orange Mass out in the eastern part of our state. And they mostly service the towns um, right around there. Whoops, Wendell is the wrong color. That should be blue. Whoops. Um, so that they serve as Orange, Wendell, and New Salem. The rest of these programs all go to Martin's Farm. And the red uh, dots are the municipal compost programs. So I have included Montague here, which is not operating yet, but they are going to be starting on March 3rd. So we will have uh, 11 compost programs at municipal transfer stations uh, within a month, month to, to from today. Um, then we also have other waste diversion programs at the more rural schools where they have a pig farmer or other livestock farmer picking up their waste daily, uh, or there's another smaller hauler that's taking it, or there's a few on-site programs. Um, but most of these are serviced by Triple T Trucking and the materials are brought to Martin's Farm in Greenfield. So before I dive into composting, I just want to cover this um, really cool map from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. And um, I'm showing again where I added this little graphic here to show where Franklin County is, which is in the northwestern area here of the state. And this map is not a scientific map. That's the most important thing I need to say about this. Uh, it's a very effective tool for comparing pay as you throw or pay T, um, also known as SMART, Save Money and Reduce Trash. These are programs of the Mass DEP. Um, and those programs uh, have a hashtag. I don't know if you can see it here. You can see it here a little bit. Um, and those programs overall on this map have less trash. So that's the purpose of this map for the Mass DEP to show that requiring residents to pay for trash and limiting the amount of trash that they can put out into the town's program makes people think with their wallets and therefore put out less trash or bring less trash to the transfer station in their town trash bag or their bag that they have to put a sticker on. So they recycle more, they compost more, uh, they reduce waste more. So it's a really effective tool. Um, so down here on the bottom of this map um, are the different colors that the, the different towns have achieved. And it reg regards how many pounds per household per year are generated by the town's um, municipal trash program. So this isn't about recycling or composting, it's just about trash. And we all know, hopefully, that the more we recycle and compost, the less we trash. So it's a really cool tool to look at that. Now, the reason I say it's not scientific is because it's based on data that's collected from the towns. So that data could be flawed, right? Or um, in the case of our towns, we ask them, how many permits to the transfer station have you sold? And we're assume, assuming that that number is the same, it is um, actually who's using the transfer station. So they might have a dumpster at their house also, they might have curbside trash service through a private hauler, although there are very few of those out here. Um, so again, it's not scientific, but it's a tool to show some trends. So here's a close-up of Western Mass, and I've also provided a 
from the bottom there the um, URL for how to get to these maps. It's a very useful uh, website because they have maps going back to 2011. And um, so you can kind of see how different towns have evolved over ta time. And again, this presentation will be shared with the participants, so you don't have to try to write down all those um, letters in the URL. You can click on it when you get the presentation. So here I've tried to um, compare the state average, which is on the left side, with the towns in our district that compost. Um, again, this is pounds of trash disposed per household per year. So I've attempted to um, copy the colors in the map here, and uh, I wasn't always successful, so bear with me. Um, the state average for pay as you throw is 1,086 pounds per household. Um, and this information is on the map. Um, oh, it's blocked out. No, it's there, over there in the corner. Um, so the state average is this for a year, non pay T, so unlimited trash, throw away whatever you want, have as much as you want, folks. Their average for across the state is 1,646 pounds per household per year of trash. So then when you look at our towns, we have a superstar town, Leverett, which is an amazing uh, town with a great transfer station with all sorts of reuse programs and a compost program. So they're able to attain a really great uh, figure, 460 pounds per household per year. Um, so we bow to them. That's unattainable for most towns. We realize that. Then more uh, normal, usual towns, <laughs> we'll call them Wendell, Orange, and Northfield also are hovering around um, lower than the state average which is around 900 to 940 pounds per household. <clears throat> so we're doing pretty good. I originally thought that this was going to prove that the composting really, really reduced the trash in these towns. And, and it does, but um, not, maybe not as much as I had hoped personally and honestly. Um, then down here, we have a one non-pay-as-you-throw town, Conway. Um, this is a 2020 figure um, because they weren't composting until the end of last year or the end of 2019. Um, and so they have 1,630 pounds of trash per household per year. So this, I guess, proves that the pay, pay as you throw programs really do force people to think with their wallet. Um, I also want to mention that most of the towns in our district have pay as you throw. Um, before I go on to the next slide. Okay, let's dive into composting a little bit here. Uh, this is a picture from Google Earth of Martin's Farm in Greenfield, where most of the compost from our region is sent. And you can see here, these windrows are quite long. I believe they are 150 yards long. I measured them on Google Earth. And uh, they are permitted to take 22 tons a day I don't know what their yearly tonnage is, um, but that's a good figure to get and I will get it for the future. Um, this is a picture I took of the windrow turner at Martin's Farm. This is how they're able to manage so many tons of materials a day. Uh, it gets stirred up by this windrow turner and here they're also adding something, probably moisture to those piles. Um, the compost thermometer that's shown is up to 140 degrees. That's actually a separate picture that I put on top of here, but I actually took the picture as Adam Martin himself put that thermometer into the middle of this pile. Uh, and they monitor and uh, track these temperatures and that's how they're able to compost so much material. They also chop it up, which is a very valuable tool in them being able to accept a lot of different materials in a huge volume. Okay, so here are some pictures of our municipal drop-off compost programs. We have 10 Franklin County towns that are doing this. Um, Bernardston, Conway, Deerfield, Greenfield, Leverett, New Salem, Northfield, Orange, Wendell, and Waitley. Starting March 3rd, as I mentioned, uh, the town of Montague, also known as Turner's Falls, will start a program. So we will have 11. 
um, in the county and there are 19 transfer stations total in the county. So we're, we're doing pretty good, uh, we're over 50%. Um, so Conway Transfer Station um, is uh, one of our newer programs. And they started out with a two cubic yard dumpster from Triple T Trucking. And that didn't end up working out too well because Triple T found this was a little far for them to be traveling to pick up a smaller amount of compost. So we had to pivot and switch to a different hauler. Um, and one of the reasons that they, they wanted to stop coming here was the school was composting in this town. But when the pandemic hit, the custodian didn't really want to manage all these little kids paper towels anymore. And so there's a lot of paper towels from hand washing that go into a bucket in the classroom and that goes into the dumpster. That was the majority of what was going into the compost dumpster because they have a pig farmer picking up their food waste. So he said, I don't really wanna uh, take this risk right now at this time. So this is an example of a problem that came up and we were able to solve it through the town being able to pay a little bit more money for a different hauler and they were able to switch to the compost cooperative which hauls to the same place martin's farm um, we have an estimated total for this site of 42 tons a year um, it's a small town it's a population of only 8, 1800 with only about 900 people using or households using the transfer station um, so it's a, not a big program, but I say don't discount these small towns. It's still uh, people diverting waste from the trash or compostable waste from the trash. Um, the Compost Cooperative is a relatively new hauler and they're the ones that are working with the town of Conway. Um, they pick up residential and commercial accounts in Greenfield and Turner's Falls. Um, this is a picture of them unloading at Green at, um, at Martin's Farm. Shows the pails they use for the residential and the toters they use for the Conway Transfer Station and their commercial accounts um, in the bigger towns. And it's a really cool um, new initiative that is aiming to provide jobs for folks that were formerly incarcerated. Uh, and it actually was born in the county jail, in the Franklin, Franklin County House of Corrections. Um, they had a, a group that was meeting weekly to talk about um, coming out of jail and how do we um, come out successfully and get jobs and housing. And this idea was born right there in the jail. And it's now been going for two or three years and it's all really, really local and really um, just, socially justice minded. Um, the Deerfield Transfer Station is serviced by Triple T Trucking. Um, so I have to talk a little bit about Triple T Trucking here and give them their due um, props here. Uh, they have a pretty dense compost route here in Franklin County, Mass but they are from Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, they haul to Martin's Farm right here in Greenfield, and they also haul to the Wyndham Solid Waste District compost site, which Bob is going to talk about also in this presentation. And um, because of them, they're the ones that really helped us at Martin's Farm get all these programs started, then new haulers and compost sites started emerging. So, We've started with all of our eggs in one basket, but now we've been able to diversify a little bit. But again, we got to give credit to Triple T Trucking, Martin's Farm, and everybody else who has had a hand in this. Um, so again, this is another site that uh, started small with a two cubic yard dumpster. All of these sites, every single one I'm talking about is picked up once a week. And um, they went up to a four cubic yard dumpster just six months later. Uh, we got a lot of help from the Energy Committee volunteers who attended town meeting and other um, other uh, events in town, and they actually sat at the transfer station for the first couple of weeks that the program was in operation, and they talked to everybody and educated residents about the program, which is more, I try to do that, but they were able to really commit to being there. So I really uh, recommend that, but it's not necessary to have a successful program without that. There's other ways to reach people. 
such as newspapers, publicity, social media, um, cable TV access channels, you name it. There's a million ways, town newsletters. So this program has an estimated 83 tons per year going through it. Um, the 2000, 2010 population uh, was 5,125. They have about 1,300 permit holders at this transfer station. And um, they have a pretty low pounds per of trash per household, 820. Um, some, some, probably some households in this town also have curbside pickup from a private hauler. So again, some of these numbers are a little fuzzy, but we can look at trends. This was a slide that was projected at the Deerfield Town Meeting. And this program really did go off quickly um, in popularity. So I think that these measures were effective. Um, so, and again, the volunteers were there handing out handouts and actually handing out compost pails, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the Northfield Transfer Station is one of our older programs. It started in 2008. You can tell that the dumpster is not looking too great. <laughs> so here, I wanted to show you this awful picture to show you that it doesn't have to be glamorous. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, sorry, that was my dog running by. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, perfectly neat and clean. Uh, they use a couple of old cross-country skis to hold open the um, cover of the dumpster. And you can see some old mums and pizza boxes in there. Um, they, we estimate they do about 63 tons a year. Um, again, we don't have a way to measure that because the trucks do not have onboard scales, um, but we don't let these things stop us. We just continue. We've got our eye on the prize here. Um, and this program is very popular, and there's an article in on the end of this presentation that um, is linked, and you can read more about that program. Um, Greenfield Transfer Station was launched in 2014. They started with a four cubic yard dumpster. They still have one. This this town might be of particular use to a lot of people on this call because um, they also have curbside pickup of trash and recycling, but then they also have a transfer station, which is very popular. Uh, and so they don't have curbside organics yet. We aren't there yet in Western Mass. There aren't any communities in Western Mass that have curbside organics, um, but we will probably get there some someday but Franklin County does have the majority of the drop-off programs in the region. Um, so this, this program is a good model for those of you that have larger towns. This town has a population of 17,000. Um, I live in this town and that's my husband. We were the first per people to use this dumpster. <laughs> so we were pretty excited. And he's just dumping out a plastic bag there. So we encourage people to use a pail, like a sure clothes pail, or a plastic bag that they dump out and then put into a trash can that is hopefully located nearby. Uh, small events and businesses also are welcome to use this dumpster as well as non-residents. So this gets a lot of use. Okay, so another model is um, made possible by Clearview Composting. And this is a picture of the Orange Transfer Station on the top and the New Salem Transfer Station on the bottom. Again, nothing fancy. We don't wait for fancy, we just go for it. Um, and people love it. They're very appreciative of these opportunities to reduce waste. So uh, Rick Inez of Clearview Composting makes these enclosures. And you can see here in the open position, it's got a little wooden, um, thing, so I'm sure someone knows the name, but I can't think of it, that turns and keeps the lid open. Uh, and it just contains three or four barrels. I think there are 20 or 30 gallon barrels with lids. And these are very small towns. Um, New Salem uh, is a very small town, uh, less than, like I think about a thousand residents. And they've been doing this since 2009. And uh, Orange is a larger town, 8,000 people, um, but this is picked up twice a week because the hauler is the same person as the processor and he's right in town. So this is a great model for a small program and it's animal proof because when this lid is closed and locked with the hasp, it's very hard to open. So animals can't get in there 
um, during the closed hours of the transfer station. Um, some best management practices. I showed you this picture in the beginning, um, but I wanted to show you again the trash can. This is the most important part of the program. Um, so if somebody brings their materials in a plastic bag, they're supposed to empty it and then throw the plastic bag either in this trash can or with their regular trash. Um, weekly pickup is really important. I once ran into a school. I don't know why they have had a every other week pickup going, but they had a real um, they had a real uh, insect problem. We'll we'll say that at that point. Um, but once they got weekly pickup, it was improved. So it's a really good way to keep the insect problems um, lower than they could be. Uh, resident education, I touched on that a little bit, but I'm sure all of the uh, recycling coordinators and townspeople and, and other folks on this call know how to get the word out. I won't go into that too much. Signage. Um, this is a metal sign that is attached to an existing recycling sign. I kind of wish they had covered up that word just to avoid confusion. But you can see here, I don't say food scraps because it's more than scraps. It could be a bag from a party of plates and the leftover cake. I mean, it could be more than scraps, right? So it's large volumes. Um, I don't say organics, I say compost. This is going to become soil. And it's my hope that with that word, people will think, oh, I won't put plastic in there because that won't become soil. You might say people don't know that, but in a rural area like ours, people tend to know that. And I'm also educating all the students in the schools. So hopefully we'll get there. Um, this is a simple bumper sticker sign that I have on most of my containers. It just says compost, food and paper, no plastic. Um, and it's just a bumper sticker and you can see it on the container there. Some of the towns have provided pails, like Deerfield provided 300 pails for their residents to use, um, but it's not a necessary thing to get the program started. In some of these towns, we've never provided pails and residents will, um, we got a lot of Yankee ingenuity here. They'll bring their waste in bags, in buckets they already have, in buckets they buy, all kinds of things. Um, and then the last best management practice is to report on success, which I need to do more of. Tell the community what they're doing and how much they're doing. Um, I've been relying on SureClose Kitchen Compost Collection pails for the last 10 years. And they are the, a sponsor of this, this um, webinar, but um, this is not a plant. This is a real slide that I always use. Um, so we've been relying on them for 10 years. We love these pails. Um, and we co coordinate a large regional order every March. And so we've, we've brought in an estimated 12,000 of these pails into our region and beyond. And it's been very successful. People are very happy with them. Uh, we get them for a little under $5. So we turn around and sell them for $5 because we want people to buy them. Um, our towns can buy them for free with their recycling dividends program funding and the green pails are made with recycled content which is a requirement of the RDP fund um, use. Uh, it has a filter in the lid but the lid closes tight uh, which is a great feature and they're only two gallons so it's really not enough for a whole household's like say week um, but some people just use this in their kitchen and then dump it into something into their garage or their shed or their back porch um, like a five gallon pail, or I use an 18 gallon um, like storage toter, and that's plenty of room to bring my waste weekly. Um, this slide has a lot of words, but I want to talk a little bit about funding. I haven't talked much about funding here, and the reason is, is a good one, and that's because every town has a little bit of a different funding structure for how much they're paying the hauler to take the waste away every week. But here's the kicker most of these programs, all but one of them costs less than $200 a month. So that's the genius of our local haulers and we thank them for that. However, over the last few years, a, um, a wonderful thing has emerged and that is that towns who are receiving recycling dividends points or from the RDP program can use the money that they get from that program, from the state, 
to pay entirely for this program. So most of the towns that I've mentioned here are doing this for a low cost, but then they're getting reimbursed from the state um, for, for having these programs. Um, one of the requirements that the state has for this is um, that the town has to also sell home compost bins. And that's a measure to try to get people to, to remember, like not to forget about home composting. Um, so it's a, a requirement that they subsidize the cost of home compost bins. And um, it's gone over really well with our towns and, and they're, all, they're all the ones that are having a compost program also doing this. So uh, here are the bins that we sell, uh, earth machines. We sell them in four locations across the county. We get them on mass state contract for $49.50 each. And we turn around and we make a 50% uh, profit and sell them for 50 bucks to the residents of most of the towns or, or the non-composting towns. I guess most of the towns is the other way now. Most of the towns um, compost now, so they are selling them for a $25 price, and then they subsidize the rest of the cost, $25, which again is paid for by RDP funds. Um, if anybody has more questions about that, you can let me know. Really quickly, a couple of business examples. Um, the Shelburne Falls Compost Collaborative has been <coughs> successful since 2010. And it's consisting of four restaurants, a weaving school, and the Bridge of Flowers, famous Bridge of Flowers in Shelburne Falls. And um, they participate for free uh, because the restaurants, um, you know, have just enough volume to fill it up anyway. So they're adding a little bit more. Um, it's a centrally located compost dumpster and uh, the restaurants bring their waste over to this dumpster like at the end of the day or the end of the shift or, or what have you. Um, and the, the inclusion of the Bridge of Flowers waste really helps cut down on insects and odor because you're covering that food waste with that leafy material. I wanted to include this picture of the West End Pub, which, pub, which is a really tiny restaurant um, sometimes people say to me like, well, we wouldn't have enough room to do that. And you cannot believe how small this restaurant is. Um, the two little bins on the bottom are is a four gallon uh, compost bucket and a milk crate for recycling. And so these are emptied when needed and brought to other receptacles. But they're fitting it right underneath their dirty dishes. Uh, Turner's Falls also has a new composting effort. Um, this isn't as organized as the one I just described, um, but it was um, it obtained through uh, citizen outreach. So a group called Drawdown Montague went around actually talking face to face. This was before the pandemic with uh, any business any businesses in Turner's Falls that had food and um, convinced a whole bunch of them that they could compost. And so we were, or they were getting ready to do that and then the pandemic hit. So it was going to be about six or seven businesses and organizations and right now it's only a couple, but we hope that once things get back to normal, um, they can you know, contact the compost cooperative or another hauler and get it going again. Um, here's my information, so please contact me with any information. I've also included um, some links down at the bottom of newspaper articles that we've had about our programs that have been a great way to educate the public. Of course, not as many people are reading their local newspapers, um, so we, we try to get them from all angles. Uh, this picture is of my son when he was five, and he was gleefully putting his rotting jack-o-lantern into our home composter so I, I shot a picture and he was very um happy to to see his beloved pumpkin turn into soil so kids love composting uh, so that's that's it for me thank you very much lynn thanks amy sensational um uh presentation you've had lots of kudos and you know they don't give me a count for how many questions came in but approximately 40 or 50 so wow. i'm telling people right now we're not getting to all of them so um but with that uh amy i'm going to mute you for the moment we'll uh, uh we'll ask you to mute yourself i'll have you um unmute yourself uh when we get to questions 
And with that, um, Bob, um, Spencer, could you uh, speak so I know that you that we can hear you? I am here, Lynn. Excellent, excellent. And uh, I'm going to um, run the slides for Bob. Um, is there a video? Is there a? Am I on video too? Uh, I don't see you, but um, because I'm running the slides, I actually don't know. I don't. Uh, Terry, can you tell me? Uh, can you see Bob? I cannot see Bob. We cannot see you, Bob. How do How do I activate <laughs> the, the video? Up on the dashboard, there's a little uh, below the mic icon. There's a little whited out the, sort of camera. It says uh, webcam. Yes, that's it. Share my webcam. Yep. Sorry, I haven't used this platform. Oh, there I am. Sorry, folks. Great. Okay. Um, how's the time? looking Lynn uh, well let's keep it moving we're, we're running okay. um, Amy went a little over um, and of course we have a third speaker also so you can chug okay. along and well, hopefully uh, uh, so I'm on your first slide um, so I'm gonna move to your second slide and yeah, just tell me when you. to change okay I'll just say next okay um, I just would like to say I'm intimately familiar with both um, Franklin County and Amy's program uh, and also your your our next speaker uh, Connor Miller with Black Earth. Um, we're all colleagues in this business. Uh, also, um, the program in Brattleboro, where I work, uh, basically evolved out of Franklin County. And the unifying thread there is Triple T Trucking, which you'll be hearing more about. So this cover photo just shows our very low-tech compost site at our transfer station in Brattleboro. Behind that is a closed landfill, which if I updated this picture, now has uh, 25 acres of solar panels. Next, please. Um, we've mentioned Triple T Trucking. Amy explained what they collect. Um, Triple T was working with Martin's Farm and serving Wyndham County, Vermont for quite a few years. And then the district, and I'll explain, opened its own compost site. So. We're in the same waste shed and we all work together. Next, please. Our partnership here is, is three ways. Wyndham Solid Waste, Triple T Trucking, and the town of Brattleboro. Next. Um, Brattleboro next is a town of 12,000. It's set on the Connecticut River. Across the river is New Hampshire. And just to the south is one town and then Massachusetts, Franklin County. Next, um, the curbside program, this is run by the town. They hire Triple T. They have over 4,000 uh, housing units that are eligible. They do not service commercial or large apartments. Um, and we started the organics collection in, in 2013. Uh, next. Um, the tonnages here, you might want to look at all this later, but the point is that the starting in 2014, 222 tons, and I call it organics, like Amy was making the distinction, we have a broad range of organics, which I'll show you. And go to the next slide, we're up to, in, 2000, in FY19, over 623 tons of food waste, and it's actually a little higher than that now. But the point of this slide is that with the tons of recyclables collected, curbside and the tons of organics. The town residential program has an overall recycling rate of 65%. The state of Vermont's goal by by now is 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 50%. So um, Brattleboro has accomplished that, as have other towns that have organics. Basically the organics pushes them up into the 50% range. Next. Um, this is just a cost saving slide. Brattleboro is a green community, but they really do focus on the green dollars. Um, the select board approves all of these uh, contracts. And this program is saving Brattleboro around $40 a ton because the organics tip fee is significantly less than the trash disposal fee. Um, right now, I'd say the program's saving closer to $35,000 a year. Next. Again, the teamwork is really uh, how this all comes together. Um, we just have a very cooperative approach. Um, Triple T is a really great company. It's, it's a small private hauler. 
um, based in Brattleboro, but servicing Western Massachusetts, um, Western New Hampshire, and much of South Southeastern Vermont. Uh, we also have great citizen participation. Um, I I was very skeptical that we could make a marketable compost from residential curbside organics, thinking we'd have so much inorganic contamination. And we actually have very little. I would say it's less than 1% by volume. Next. Uh, we are permitted uh, in Vermont. They make it easy to permit a small food waste composting facility. They use the term food waste. Um, we can take up to 2,000 cubic yards of food waste and up to a 3,000 yards of yard waste. Actually, the total capacity is 5,000 yards. Um, we also have a, an, a permit to take soiled paper and cardboard as an amendment. It's very low tech. We just use a loader. We have a screener, and that's about it. Um, very low tech, turned windrow. We track the, the temperatures. Uh, we report it to the state. And my employees, including me, are all uh, taking certified operator courses put on by the state of Vermont, which, by the way, is a very good operator course, which is just concluding uh, this week. Next. And then this is the list of materials. As Amy said, we're all about diversion. We're not trying to make an organic certified compost, which doesn't allow, you know, biodegradable cutlery or bags or, you know, so we're about diversion and we'll take all of these materials, uh, including some pet waste. Next. Uh, as I showed, the tons has been increasing, but what this shows is the commercial tons uh, starting 2016, 26, and 18, we're up to 315. Um, we're up over 500 tons now. I have to update this. Next. Brattleboro um, came up with a cool um, logo for their curbside toters. They started offering um, both. 23 gallon and 13 gallon um, totes that they sell at a subsidized rate. Brattleboro has a 90 meter ski jump and hosts an international ski jumping competition in February each year and is very popular and will celebrate its 100th anniversary as a ski jump next a year from now. Um, next. This is a typical set out. Um, you can see the compost toter and recyclables on the left photo. And then on the right, you can see the pay-as-you-throw bags. Brattleboro has two different sizes, and the one's purple, the larger one, one's yellow, costing $3 per bag or $2 per bag. There's also um, recyclables, and then the buckets on the right are organics. Um, like Amy said, we let people use any kind of container as long as it has a lid, a locking lid for food scraps. Next. That's a NERC slide. Um, here's a quote from one of our select board members. He's not on the board right now. But again, he's emphasizing the, um, uh, the town saving money. That's his last statement there. That's Dave Scholes. Uh, and they're proud of their program, as you can imagine. Next. Um, contracts are important. Um, the town and Triple T have a seven-year contract, and they were uh, agreeable to have a, a, a another uh, contract running in parallel between Wyndham Solid Waste and the town. The town is a member of the district, our largest member town, um, but we needed a contract because they they um, are actually billed for the the organics that come to us. There's no tipping fee for the yard waste. Um, it's important to look at the bottom two bullets. They collect single stream and organics weekly and trashes every other week. Next. <clears throat> um, again, this is um, what the sources that come into our site, residential curbside, commercial institutional, and our own drop-off site, which I'll mention a little bit later. Next, we use two 
two cubic yard dumpsters. Uh, they're tipping dumpsters. Um, and I we weigh every single load, a uh, huge range in weights, depending on all sorts of things, but over 85 separate weights in the year and a half, it's a it's 1,200 pounds per two cubic yards. Uh, there you go, Amy. There's some numbers for you. Um, so we we take take in about five tons um, per week at our transfer station of just drop off. Again, no charge for recycling in Vermont or food scrap drop off. Um, next, please. Uh, we have had some issues with odor and flies at our dumpsters once it gets warm. Uh, nothing that's been a real problem, but you know some people don't like to use it. Uh, so we've been able to successfully manage odor and flies. Um, and even bees can be an issue. And they're an issue actually more with bottles and cans. But um, so just having some wood chips and some odor control agents and good management of the bins, like Amy was saying, is the key to make them user friendly. Next. Triple T uh, has a variety of trucks, but they co-collect the single stream recycling and the organics in the same vehicle. The side load um, uh, trucks can take in food scraps, organics in one side or one half and single stream in the other half. Um, there's Triple T dumping um, their mixed organics. Go to the next one, Lynn. And you can see a lot of paper and cardboard is coming out of this is one week's worth of um, food scraps. Uh, they, they are now bringing a roll off a week rather than every day. They've tried to make it more economical for them as the hauler. So they consolidate uh, the, the four days of collection they do with two trucks each day into one um, 30 yard box. And that probably weighs about 12 to 15 tons. Next. This is from a bread manufacturer uh, in Brattleboro. We have two bread manufacturers. Um, and this is a, a 30 yard compactor um, that comes every week and now twice a week. The pandemic has greatly increased the amount of bread that they're selling, both companies. Um, this is Vermont Bread Company. And we also have Against the Grain, which is a gluten free baker. Uh, you can see this is beautiful material, really no contamination, and makes uh, great dirt. Next. We also have two now. Um, this is the first one. Um, residential um, collection subscription programs. Connor's going to talk about their programs in Eastern Mass. Uh, this is called Elm City Compost out of Keene, New Hampshire. So they're coming into our site in Brattleboro. Um, they, their business was started three years ago and it's just really exploded. And New Hampshire does not have mandatory food scrap diversion like Vermont does, but a lot of people want to do it. Enough that there's businesses. We have a new new uh, residential collection operator in Wyndham County now, which just started. Next. We also take the Brattleboro curbside leaves, uh, which is only two weeks in the spring and two weeks in the fall uh, so it's not enough leaves and carbon to to mix with that um, organic so we we get leaves and wood chips from a variety of other sources for our bulking agents next very simple as i said we use a loader it's a nice large loader with a five cubic yard bucket to um, as the load is dumped as you saw that, that pile is mixed with the bulking agents within an hour, I would say, on average of when it's dumped and then covered. Pile is coated with uh, six inches of, of either screening overs or, um, or wood chips just to minimize attractiveness to birds, animals, and also to provide a, a layer of biofilter for odor control. Next, please. Compost marketing, this is the key to this. I mean, if you do not have good markets, uh, this is not a fun 
project to be taking on. So we have put a lot of work into developing markets and it literally takes years. Um, you know, you start and it's new, people are wary, what's in it, you know, all that. We did a branding, a nicknamed it Brattle Grow Compost. Um, we, of course, do the testing required by Vermont regulations. It's very clean as far as heavy metals and pathogens. We also send it out to university labs for agronomic testing of pH and organic matter content and micronutrients, uh, conductivity. Um, I'll show you a picture of some of our flower boxes put in tires. And we also have an on-site vegetable garden at the scale house. As people pull up, they, they see these monster squash plants and tomatoes growing right next to them. And they go, hey, look at that. Next. Yeah, we do bag some of it by hand and we sell bags for $5 each to residents that want to. We have a network of distributors paying $25 a yard. We don't sell to small users at our site. We're just not set up to load everyone's pickup truck. Um, if someone wants to buy 10 cubic yards or more, we will load them. And we also don't want to undermine our distributors. So but you can see our sales have really um, taken off over the years. Uh, it goes for a large range of projects. Uh, when we built the solar array, we used a lot of compost for erosion control and revegetation. Okay, we also donate um, a lot of compost to towns, schools, and community gardens. And this has been really useful. I say a lot, it's small compared to the amount we sell. We might donate 20, 30 yards a year. Next. The revenue from our facility um, has been very solid and consistent. Uh, this last fiscal year, we had $61,000 in compost sales. It was about 3,000 cubic yards. Um, the overall organics program is tracked as a as a profit center or a cost center for the district. Our transfer station, our hazardous waste programs, and our organics are the main cost centers. And it generated ninety thousand dollars of profit for the district uh, in FY20. Um, very low technology. I emphasize this. I have been involved, as Lynn said, with with high tech composting facilities and closed automated turning, biofiltration, scrubbers, screeners, and it's not easy to make money with all that equipment. Um, Connor's been going through some similar evaluations with his site too, it's not easy. Uh, we did. We do have a trommel screen that I got with, with a, a grant of 40% from the state of Vermont. That's been a big help. We also reduce our labor costs because our operators are also running a transfer station um, and they can go to the compost site for an hour or two and then return to their other work. So it's not a dedicated full-time staff person. Uh, and then we share the equipment, our, our large loader, and then we use a backhoe too. And that's also used uh, at the other operations. Next. So I mentioned Brattle Grow. Um, we screen the compost to two different sizes, three eighths of an inch. We have an interchangeable rotary screen on the trommel and also one half inch and different uh, retail uh, outlets prefer different quality. But the emphasis seems to be shifting to the half inch. Uh, it's a little more substance to it, not as fine and dense. Uh, and there's Brattle Grow, all purpose compost. Next. There's, the, you see that's a tire, that's a truck tire. And uh, we have, when there's one next to it, the white uh, petunias. Um, this is, we have 20 of these scattered around our site and we put flowers in them and it's a really nice way to show off the power of our compost. Next. Just, Amazing, I always say, when you look at that pile that came in from the curbside program or the bread and the leaves and you turn it into something um, that is very marketable. As I say, compost and organics 
is the only recyclable material that is used locally. Everything else goes, we don't even know where. Next. Donations to schools uh, for their own gardens and landscaping has been really useful. The schools, most of them have food scrap composting at their schools or their own backyard composting. You can see the raised beds in the background there at the school. Next. This is a, <clears throat> a hospital um, counseling center in Brattleboro. Uh, they're, they're a landscape contractor and the and the owners of this facility love the 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 compost they don't have to fertilize it they don't have to use uh herbicides so it's kind of a natural lawn care um system those hills you see in the background that's new hampshire across the river next of course we monitor temperatures it's required by the state we record all this um and like Amy was said, you usually get 140, 150 degree temperatures. Next. We do test the compost. We're required by the state to test for heavy metals and pathogens. But as I mentioned, we also send it out for other parameters. We've done bioassays. In fact, I just ordered today a packet of Solvita test kits. Um, we're going to run some Solvita tests. That's a stability test for those of you not familiar with it. Um, we also want to confirm the pathogen um, kill. So we, we have the pathogens, fecal, coliform, and salmonella tested by independent labs. And we encourage our staff to get familiar with using the, the product. And almost all of our staff and, and some of our board members are uh, or users of the product and can attest to it. Next. These are our distributors. This is a typical garden center, um, mulch, you know, rock, wood chips, compost, loam. Next. And the next photo, Lynn. This is a new venture I'm working on right now. Um, we're blending uh, the compost and making a topsoil. Um, we're working with a, a contractor that owns a sand and silt pit to blend basically a one, one, one compost sand and silt to make a manufactured topsoil. I've actually been making this for four years and using and testing it. And we're now ready to start promoting it. Um, we're targeting um, large highway jobs and stormwater uh, management projects that take that need state permits and to open up some large users that would buy you know hundreds of yards at a time. And you, actually, you could, um, um, I know you're close to the end but um, if you could you know wrap it up in the near future that would be wonderful. Sure. I, I think you. I'm it. Sure. Oh, Next. Thanks. There you go. Well, I'm psychic. Yeah. How's that, Lynn? <laughs> oh, it's, it's like it's like I control the world. <laughs> you got it. Hey, thank you, everyone. Thank you, and I thank you so much, Bob. That that was great. Um, really appreciate it. And now we're going to hear from Connor, and we're going to be doing something a little bit unusual here, uh, which is that first I have to um, uh, change the presenter. Um, and uh, we're going to make it to Connor. Um, but Connor, uh, thanks, Bob, um, is uh, going to have a few words. And then I, when he tells me to go, um, I am going to show a video. So Bob, you could you can turn your camera off if you want. And um, and Connor, it's all yours. And really Sorry. looking forward to it. So I'll try to avoid the same stuff that Amy and uh, Bob covered. Um, but I also want to say I love their just their attitude to make stuff happen, go forward. It's not too complicated to uh, to do composting. So I hope people don't get uh, too nervous to make the jump into doing it. Pretty simple. But uh, our basic business model is 
both the collection and the composting side. We collect from residents and commercial stops. So we kind of cover the whole spectrum from the smallest, uh, which is residents and offices up to colleges, supermarkets. And uh, that can help us get more dense routes when we are already in an area, we can just do more stops. Uh, and we cover from Worcester down to Cape Cod and up to Cape Ann. So pretty much like the Eastern half of Massachusetts. Uh, we have compost sites that we operate ourselves in Groton and Ma uh, Manchester, Massachusetts. And we also drop off at other compost sites and a couple AB sites. Um, and <clears throat> I would say one of the bottlenecks in this, we've been doing it for 10 years, is uh, getting compost sites started has been that that is probably one of the bottlenecks because suitable land for doing it in eastern Massachusetts um, can be challenging because of the population densities. But uh, we also do a lot of drop off programs for residents, and uh, I'll talk about that more after the video. So if you want to show the video, that okay, that's that's... how a residential program works. Okay, so I've uh, never done this live on a on a webinar before, um, and but you, I'm sure you all see it. And Doesn't seem like the sound's going through, but um, but do you want to scratch the video? It might not be working that well. Even the audio is not working. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, we do residentials in a variety of different manners. Uh, the primary one is direct with to resident private pay. Uh, and that's when you could just be in a town and we go through different levels of participation. If let's say 
Uh, we see a town where 40 or 50 people have pre-registered on our website that they'd like us to start a route in their town, then we will start a route. And, uh, and then if that grows to, it depends on the size of the town, but if that grows to say 300 people, then we might reduce the price from say $99 to $69 for six months. And, uh, and then if it grows again to maybe 600 residents, it all depends per town, but then we will lower the price again to maybe $49. So we kind of scale up. As we scale up the participation, we drop the prices and more people come in. And uh, so that's like our general private pay method. Uh, we do citywide collection in Manchester and uh, about 30% of the town participates. And that's, so that's taxpayer funded. Uh, and it's great in Manchester because we operate the town site. So it's really low cost uh, for us to be able to drive from the compost site over to collect residents and stuff. But sometimes on other citywide programs, when the towns uh, do those programs, it can be a prevailing wage program, which can, they can make the costs go up a bit. Uh, so for instance, we did a pilot program in Beverly and um, that prevailing wage rate was $46 an hour. Now, because I'm the owner, I didn't pay myself uh, a fraction of that, but uh, that can just make things too expensive to, so they don't even happen. So um, that's one of the bottlenecks on when cities pay for programs is triggering the prevailing wage rates that can be upwards of $50 an hour. Uh, but uh, so we do private pay pretty much across Eastern Mass, um, anywhere from probably like 20 stops in some towns up to a couple thousand in other towns. Um, some towns like Newton, Brookline, Belmont, and others have done a preferred vendor program where the city gets behind one hauler and markets it. So a couple of years, or it's been about a year and a half where we started Newton like that. And the day we were awarded the preferred, the preferred vendor, we were, uh, the mayor emailed about 20,000 households and like a thousand people signed up within a week of that. So there's a lot that towns can do to drive this forward. Uh, if they have email lists that can help, PTOs are often a big help. So just using like existing networks like PTOs and schools and stuff like that can, uh, can help get the word out. Other towns have bought um, our bins and bags in bulk and distributed them from transfer stations. Um, and that is another good way. It's, it's great to have towns get behind the program because it uh, it shows that they consider it an important thing, and I think residents of that town think harder about it when the town is supporting something like that. Um, so we have not had issues with contamination, um, so that's been great. I, we're right around where Bob is at that one percent level, um, and. Before COVID, our average resident was doing about 11 pounds per week uh, per, ho per household. Uh, and with COVID, everything went up like 20%, so it's more like 13%. Uh, but meanwhile, the, the restaurant volume went way down, so they pretty much evened out. Uh, compostable bags really keep the whole process clean. We, we require bags of some kind, whether it's compostable or paper bags, because in the summer without any bags, the bins can get really nasty. Uh, we do pick up weekly. We think that's a necessity in the summer, um, but it keeps bins clean in the summer and in the winter without a bag, uh, everything can get frozen right to the bin and we can't empty it when that happens. So we really, Think bags of some sort are great. And the compostables break down in our piles within like a month. Um, we have a bucket grinder that shreds it all up and mixes it. And we think compostables are a great 
part of the compost program because uh, they break down well. They keep everything clean for us, for 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 the residents. Uh, I think they keep contamination down, uh, especially because the, there's so many takeout bins and forks and uh, all this. The the growth of the compostable uh, stuff has been great, and it's made of it adds carbon to our process, which helps keep things drier and. Uh, and also means less of a carbon stockpile we need to keep on the site, which opens up more space. So we love having compostables. Um, I think maybe if other compost sites didn't like compostables, it's probably because uh, because we're a hauler, we know that compostables are really important to the to the uh, customer resident, and so we have to turn piles more frequently because of that. But other compost sites that have been around for, let's say, 20 years, maybe they weren't used to taking stuff like that. We had to turn it more often. But uh, yeah, um, overall, our process takes about six months or so. And uh, again, we drop off at two of our own sites, several other compost sites, and a couple AD sites. and. The AD is uh, is good because there's not enough capacity in the state for compost sites to absorb everything, uh, but there is more waste produced when you drop it off at an AD because the compostable bags don't go through that. Um, they get shredded and put into the trash process. It can't tell the difference between what's compostable plastic and what's regular plastic. So it results in more waste but it can handle so much more than compost sites. So there's a place for both programs. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Connor. And apologies um, about the audio and the video not being perfect. Oh, that's all right. Uh, but I will be, um, when I post the this webinar recording, and the two PowerPoint presentations, I will also post that YouTube link. And again, as a reminder, all of that will be on the NERC homepage uh, later today. And um, and I know you will, Terry will also be posting it on the NMOA website. You guys have been sending in wonderful questions and I am delighted to now turn this over to Terry to figure out which questions to ask. Terry, I can't hear you. There, there you go. Now we can hear you. Thank you. So well, thanks, Lynn. Um, so it's great to uh, have all these questions. Amazing um, abundance of questions. So we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Lots of questions about contamination. You guys talked about your low rates of contamination overall. People are very interested in how you're achieving that. If you've got um, particularly where you've got uh, sites at transfer stations that are open to the public, how you control contamination, what you consider contamination. There's different types of contamination people have been asking about. Um, so this is certainly, um, you know, any tips you have on on uh, keeping out all sorts of contaminants. <laughs> the audience is very interested in that. Well, we have um, great transfer station attendance. So in most towns in my district, they check it out a few times a day and pull out any plastic bags that might be there. They might have a, a rake or a grabber or some kind of tool to grab that material out. I travel with a trash grabber in my trunk because I visit so many sites and pull things out. Um, but, you know, I don't want people to, to, to think that there's that much contamination. Um, from that comment, that's just me. I'm a weirdo. Bob? Um, yeah, education, education, education. We we really promoted when we launched this program um, the clean, um, the essential aspect of keeping it clean and returning the product to the schools and the community um, really ties people into it. We have a lot of people 
that buy the, our compost now that they know about it through our distributors. So there's a connection to it. They don't want contaminated. I we we also do not use a tub grinder or shredder, um, and I have used those in the past. Um, but by not grinding it or shredding it initially, it's not as fast a breakdown. But your bags that you do have plastic bags that come in, and you do have who knows what else comes in um i've gotten sweaters i've gotten all sorts of things that show up and uh, people think hey a cotton sweater that's compostable well not really um but anyway so the the screener that i use since the pro the materials have not been shredded they're still fairly large pieces and they come out of the um uh in the screening at the end so we we are tolerant of some amount of contamination thanks to the screening operation um, also education to the commercial generators the schools and other institutions so so connor you said you have very good rates do you want to comment more on how you achieve that a lot of questions very much. and what you consider to be contaminated sorry the audio is bad i couldn't hear the question can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So I wanted, you said you had very low contamination rates, and I guess I'm, what we've been talking about is how to achieve that. Um, well, you know, the residents, are, residents are, have been very good. I mean, we have signs about what we have. We have doc, people ask all the time, but uh, I would say the hardest place for contamination has been like, restaurants and stuff in the boston area um, we also we also service like the project oscar city of boston drop-off bins and for instance when they were unlocked and they were placed in major areas where tons of people were walking by contamination was a nightmare but uh we got locks put on and then people have a code they can enter to drop stuff off and so therefore only people that have the code can enter it and then contamination went way down but uh other than that it's really the commercial stops are the ones that can have the contamination the residents have have always been pretty good and the other thing too is when you get to a resident you open the 13 gallon lid and uh you can see almost everything right there so if it's bad you can just leave it there but when you open the lid on a 64 gallon tote, you're only seeing the top of what's in there. So it's a lot easier to hide, but yeah. Bob, did you want to say more? Um, one thing that Triple T does in Brattleboro is their drivers also inspect <coughs> recyclables loads as well as the organics. And they have these tags that they'll leave on the bin if it if it's contains too much um, contamination. I mean, they just visually look before they dump it. They'll just leave a tag, unacceptable materials. And that really gets people's attention because they go out later in the day and it's still there. So um, <laughs> working with your hauler, and Connor is a hauler and he's a processor, I think that's a huge advantage. Yeah, because if we reject a commercial bin, whoever uh, has to sort that out will realize they don't want to have that problem again. <laughs> That's right. They'll send Amy. Amy can come sort it for her. Right. Can you guys talk a little bit about, we got a couple questions about pet waste. And do you accept it? How do you handle it? Does it ruin the compost? What happens with pet waste? We don't take cat or dog waste. Um, but in one town where we service, the town has a uh, biocycle or biosolids facility that it goes to. So in that case, you can take pet waste because it goes there, but it's uh, any any other thing, you know, rabbits, chickens, whatever, horse, that's that's all great stuff. Well, Amy knows that Martin's Farm takes um, kitty litter and pet waste. No, no they don't? No. Well, okay, I'm sorry, I thought they did. Well, well, they did. We, we did start off uh, okay. several years ago. Um, one town in particular really wanted to include kitty litter because it's so heavy they wanted to get that out of their trash but i put a stop to it because i just found that it was um 
the whole bag would go into there, you know, into the dumpster at the transfer station. The kitty litter, the bag it was in, the plastic bag would be in there. And then also, you know, I, I, I don't have cats. I'm deathly allergic, but I didn't realize how many people use really like sort of plasticky looking kitty litters. Um, so they were, you know, these blue crystals and all kinds of things. I was picturing the clay stuff when I said kitty litter is okay. So, um, so I had to put a stop to it there. And um, then from then on, I said no more. So sorry, Bob. No, that's fine. <laughs> we, uh, we don't have a problem with it. Um, it's because it is heavy and Brattleboro is pay as you throw. People make that wallet decision. You know, I'm putting this heavy kitty litter in the compost bin. And um, we haven't had any issues and no pathogen issues. Um, I mean, it's high tech. I mean, it's high temperature industrial scale composting. So it breaks down. Um, so. But well, we'll certified organic. <laughs> you guys described a lot of the monitoring you're doing of the compost. Um, there we got a bunch of questions about whether included in the monitoring you're doing of your compost, your finished compost, you're looking at PFAS levels, uh, perfluorinated compounds. And if so, what are you finding? Of anything, especially if you're accepting some of the uh, biodegradable foodware, that kind of thing, that might contain those compounds. Well, so we we really stick with BPI certified stuff, and uh, and they are much stricter now on PFAS, and so it hasn't been a problem. But uh, we do send it out to get tested, and I think one of the biggest sources previously was the uh, kitchen lunch trays that were, because we'd get tons of those, uh, and those have the, the PIPA coating. They used to, at least. Now now they don't, that we accept. So uh, that's the good thing with BPI turning the corner. We have a clear source to say, get this certified stuff, and we can take it. And similarly, we, we um, want BPI certified um, containers and bags, et cetera. But um, the state of Vermont does not have a standard for um, PFAS or any of those uh, related um, compounds, and there's a bunch of them, um, for, for compost. And uh, they do for groundwater, and I run a closed landfill, and we test our monitoring wells for PFAS now, but they have a standard for groundwater, and I know what I'm trying to achieve. Um, so I've said to the state, they've asked me would I test it. I said, if you have a standard, we'll test it. But I'm not just going to go get an analysis and find out it's 13 parts per trillion and what is the standard. Um, so they may have a standard coming up. In fact, there's legislation being considered in Vermont right now that would do that. Um, but, you know, it's a, I, I call it a sleeping um it's a sleeper issue out there. It, it, it could be very uh, harmful to the composting industry if states um, promulgate very strict PFAS levels for compost. So, so far it has not been a regulatory issue, but I think it will be. Good question. So just to follow up one little tidbit on that, um, if anybody who's listening and doesn't know what we're talking about, go to the website bpiworld.org and you can see what products are approved by BPI and they only uh, approve products now um, that don't have PFAS. Um, and also on my yes and no list, which again are not fancy, it's not done by a graphic designer, it's done by me. At the bottom I say um, compostable plastic brands must be BPI certified and I give the logo which is a particular logo. So I'm educating residents about what that is. Yeah, so BPI stands for the Biodegradable Products Industry. Yes, um, thanks. Institute, I'm sorry. Um, okay, I Lynn, um, do we have one, time for one more question or? If, you well, if you, at, we're, we are at time, but we've still have got quite a few people on, so ask a simple one. <laughs> simple one? <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, you know, uh, there were some questions, Amy, about sort of the relationship of cage <laughs> and contamination and sort of, you know, are you seeing, how you see the interplay of pay as you throw with com 
you know, collection of um, organics and food waste. Um, and, and whether they get, that gives an incentive for more contamination, you know, uh, how, how that interplays was, was a lot of questions about that. Um, I, I don't find it to be a problem. Um, people aren't trying to, you know, sneak their coffee maker into the uh, compost dumpster because it would be pretty obvious. It's right there and the attendant would be like, what are you doing? Um, but I have seen at one transfer station in particular, I have seen someone try to put a coffee maker into the recycling dumpster roll off. Um, and that is a town with pay as you throw. So uh, I said to this individual, what are you doing? That's not recyclable, like meaning in that container. And he said, well, it is to me. <laughs> so, God love That's him. all that matters. It was to him. <laughs> so, you know, it does happen. Um, but the transfer station attendants, I, I can't say enough about them. They're, they're hardworking. They, they don't miss a beat. Um, and we just rely on them, you know, to 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 monitor and you know some of our recycling that's coming out of our transfer stations is so clean um it's processed at the springfield materials recycling facility springfieldmurf.org is the website there and uh compared with what other towns like curbside towns are sending in our stuff is as clean as a whistle uh morning noon and night so they're doing a great job we live in a great area too so we got to give the residents some props Definitely. I think we're going to have to cut off the sensational conversation. Uh, wonderful presentations and the generosity of your time. Really appreciate it. I will say zillions of questions and several people have a great sense of humor. Uh, somebody just posted, oh, just ask all the questions. So what I will say instead is that I will send the questions to the presenters and they will have the, uh, along with contact information, and they'll have the opportunity to reply directly to people if they great. want to. Again, thank you so incredibly much. It's always wonderful to partner with NAMOA on these events. Uh, thank you to our sponsors again. And just a quick note that NERC has a webinar coming up on March 9th about uh, plastic bag film recycling and M markets. And of course, we have a conference coming up virtual March 30th to 31st. Everything's on the NERC homepage as it should be. And with that, we'll say have a great evening, everybody. And again, thank you so very much. And uh, we look forward to having you on future events. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Lynn. You're welcome. Thanks, Terry. Thank you.